some people think of detox and they would immediately go to juice cleanse or I can't eat for three days. And it's like, that's not what we're talking about here. Our bodies have two real primary phases of detoxification. They have pathways. So in our phase one detoxification pathways, certain mechanisms of action, certain processes are happening in our body. In our phase two detoxification pathway, which is the more complicated of the detox pathways, other processes are happening. And our body is always working to open up and release toxins through those pathways. But the reality of our modern world is we are constantly inputting ourselves with things that close the valve sometimes on those pathways, or at least make those pathways not work as optimally. What is the process of letting go of ego? Because, you know, much like with my own family, when I said, I no longer want to work for this big prestigious cardiology group, I want to step away and do this entrepreneurial thing that my parents thought I was completely insane. How hard, because I know like divesting yourself of that title, I mean, you're still an attorney, of course, but like divesting yourself of that experience, that exposure, for many people, the choices of occupation are really ego mediated as opposed to mission mediated. And so how did you work through that? I would imagine even in a healthy individual, that's that's a challenging transition. I love that question, Cynthia, because that's really what it is. So what a lot of people don't know, because we're not taught this at any level of school, is that we, as the human that we rendered through, that we that, that we are, the human that we are has an ego side, and then what is often referred to as a higher self or a soul. So some people refer to the ego as the small S self or your little self or your personality, and then the soul is your higher self. So really what started to happen for me, and I'm not going to pretend this journey is easy, when people start the journey of waking up to find out who they truly are, there are a lot of things you go through in terms of relationships dissolving, dark nights of the soul, shedding this identity that you had. I'm still in the process of it. Once you start waking up, you really never get done doing it because we're going to do that for the rest of our lives. So for me, you're absolutely right. Letting go of like my ego loves to tell people about my bodybuilding career, my marathons, the fact that I was top 50 female attorney in Minnesota when I left. Like my ego likes to get that out and be like, see, see, am I still good enough? Do you still like me? Am I here? But my soul truthfully doesn't care about any of that. My soul genuinely is really desiring to serve and reach as many people as possible and to make them feel better and so that we can all elevate and all lift each other up together. So in terms of the process, what it looked like for me is really sticking to regular meditation. Consistent meditation has been critical for me. I also have a lot of healers and energy coaches around me who I do sessions with, whether whether in a group setting or individual work. I also go on a lot of spiritual retreats. I know that, you know, you and I follow each other on social media. So I post about those things. Sometimes I talk a lot about energy because I really believe it's the most important work we can do. I, up until the point that I started meditating in 20, 2017, I had been in what I refer to as th- the traditional therapy model for many, many years. I was divorced in 2012. My husband and I used to do couples therapy. After we got divorced, I did therapy. I did therapy as a single person in my marriage. And I thought therapy at the time was very useful and beneficial until it wasn't. And what I tell people is when you start waking up, what you realize is that model, although it was useful, it's just a very, very slow. It's very slow for me anyways. And I like to move fast. (laughs) I like to do things quick. So I would be in this model where I would go see the counselor, tell her everything that had happened the last couple of weeks. She would give me some feedback. I would go live my life. And then I felt like I was doing kind of that all over again on a two, three week or month period, like Groundhog's Day. When I started meditating, it was like I finally was able, with assistance from meditation coaches and other energetic healers, get at the root of what some of these things were that were causing me to get in. I'll give an example for myself, bad relationship patterns, or that were causing me to feel like I literally only feel value and worth when I'm highly productive and always achieving. Why can't I just sit down and be still and allow that to be enough? So it's been things like that that I've had to do to really shed that ego, like you said, and and then also stand in awareness of when it's happening. You know, I now can observe my ego in a way I couldn't have done five years ago. I can now be the higher self sitting here like, oh, isn't that interesting? You got triggered when so-and-so said X, Y, and Z. And so I'll note my triggers and I'll work to really uh, not judge them, but have awareness around them and then work to release them and let them go. 
It's really interesting because when I met you and for everyone that's listening, unless someone was at that event, Chris and I were completely, you know, organically drawn together, hung out together the whole weekend. And you were such a positive light amongst, you know, a myriad of wonderful people that we were around. And I think when you recognize that someone else is doing the work, you're just drawn to them in a very kind of healthy way. And I echo a lot of what you're saying that for me, I did the traditional therapy for a long time. And I always say, I'm always going to be investing and making sure I'm the best version of myself available for my clients, for my family, et cetera. And energy work has been a large part of what I've done the last four years. And it's sometimes hard to explain to people because you have to be open enough to understanding that there are things you cannot see tangibly, but are there. And I think energy work is something that I will probably do for the rest of my life. In fact, I have two practitioners in my life and I'm very actively involved in my practice of if I get triggered or if something really bothers me, it's like, what's really going on there? What am I lending attention to? And so for listeners that are listening to this, you know, we can talk about Reiki work or energy work, but it's things that, you know, quiet the autonomic nervous system. They get you into the parasympathetic, this rest and repose side of the body. And most, if not all of us are sympathetic dominant. We're always working on the to-do list. We can't slow ourselves down. We struggle to sleep. We struggle to turn our brains off. And I think finding ways, especially as middle-aged women navigating this process, the women that are doing the work are the ones that are having the easiest transition from perimenopause into menopause. And whereas I think a lot of women fight it for a variety of reasons, and there's never any judgment, but you know, you and I see these people every day, whether it's on social media or they become our clients, they're fighting it every step of the way. And I always say there's some degree where you have to just let go and just accept that, you know, there is a process and and you can't be in control of everything, nor do we want to be. It's just, it's so exhausting to be in that mindset or methodology where everything has to be perfect, has to look perfect. We have to be perfect. I always say I'm perfectly imperfect. In fact, I just did a reels on this because I kept saying to people, yeah, you think this side of the camera looks perfect, but the reality is there's a whole messy desk right here, depending on what day of the week it is, what time it is, how much things are going on. And so I think it's really important for people to understand that even high level women can have these moments where we're like, okay, we're given this opportunity where we can, you know, sink or swim, or we can take, you know, um, adversity and create tremendous opportunity from that. And I love that you have this incredible pain to purpose story and certainly one that's really relatable for so many people. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned in there, Cynthia, that I just want to touch on is this concept of surrender because it really has been some of my deepest work in terms of my journey with energy work over the last four or five years. It's funny, you and I started, it, it's so interesting to me how synchronistic the world is because you and I literally had kind of the same length of career in our career number one. And we've been doing energy work for the same amount of time and building our businesses, which is so exciting. And I just love having that those common interests with you because I felt so connected with you when I met you also. And it's that it really has to do with the fact that people every single person on this planet vibrates at a certain frequency. So I always say, if you want to think about it, just for your brain to have a way to get your head around it, you could think about it just as tuning into a particular radio station. Some people are vibrating at 88.7, some are vibrating at 100.3, some are vibrating at 106.4. And it really doesn't mean the 106.4 is better than the 88 something. It's not better than. It simply is the frequency at which you vibrate. And the higher you raise your frequency of vibration, the easier everything becomes in your life. So one of the things that's been exciting for me is, although I'm a nutritional therapist and I coach and help people understand about their bodies, I work with men and women, I work with couples, I do a lot of one-on-one coaching, I teach group courses. I have had now recently a few different people hire me simply for energy coaching. And it's something that I figured that when my business name came to me in Gosh, it was some time. It was well before I left the practice of law. And I didn't even know I was going to start a business. Okay. But I was in a meditation and the name energetically efficient came to me in meditation. And I thought, well, that's a cool name. What does that even mean? So I really had understood in my evolution of my own business, I would be doing energy work at some point more significantly with people. And it's sort of all coming into being right now as people are saying, I don't want meal plans. I don't need that kind of assistance. What I really need is help elevating my frequency so that life gets easier. I want to get over my things I have. I'll just give an example. Um, I've got one person who has some issues around scarcity, 
with financial abundance. So we're going to work on that. You know, another person is they really want to transition their career. And so they want some guidance because I, of course, did that. And so they want help with that. But when we start, it's like a, a you put a penny in a pond and it's a ripple effect. So we start working on our energy. We then service clients who start working on theirs. They help other people who work on theirs. And it really is a ripple effect that just goes out into the oneness, which makes me the most excited. I can imagine. And I think that's the irony is you can't see my podcast prep sheet, but the very next thing that I wanted to kind of lean into was common limiting beliefs because we work with so many women. And I was like, this is true serendipity, you know, talking about what are the things we put in our way that don't allow us to reach our full potential or, you know, have us in this scarcity mindset, whether it's about money or opportunities or, and let me be clear, all of us can have days. I mean, days, minutes, hours where we experience that. And that's completely normal. But I know for myself, when I'm in true alignment, when I am very forward thinking in a very healthy way, when I'm energetically where I should be, I don't even worry about things anymore. It's like, I know what will come. I know what, you know, it's like you have this mindset of abundance, which I think getting to that point where I am, whether it's chronological or psychological or spiritual or however you want to think about it really is life changing. But when you're working with these women in particular, you mentioned money, money is energy. So common and limiting beliefs, money, you know, the scarcity resources, and it can be intergenerational. Like maybe someone's parents were, had a very much a scarcity mindset about money. So that's embedded into them, into their DNA. And then they're bringing that into a marriage or relationship. Where do you really start between the scarcity mindset or even societal programming to help people re-navigate or kind of recalibrate themselves? Great question. It starts to me first by having an awareness around what the thoughts or the behaviors are. So we can't change anything about ourselves unless we become aware that we're actually thinking it, doing it, believing it, not believing it. So whatever the awareness is first, I would say I note that. And then one of the things that I actually took my members in my membership through last Wednesday on our membership was rather than talk about anything nutrition related, we wrote down a bunch of new moon manifestations because the potent new moon that happened on October 25th and the potent full moon that's coming on November 8th are very, it's a very important time right now to be creating and manifesting things into your life. So what I said was, I want to start this meeting by reminding every single one of you here, you literally can be, have, do, achieve absolutely anything you want to. The only thing stopping you is yourself. And when people hear that, they're like, oh, come on, that's really not true. But it causes them to pause. And I'm like, no, no, it's really true. And we all do it. We all have these ways that we not necessarily even self-sabotage, but certainly self-limit. So I said, as a way for us to just overcome that in this exercise, I want everyone's homework to be write down 10 personal manifestations intentions and 10 professional manifestations intentions that you want to call into being in 2023. And when I say the sky's the limit, I mean, literally the sky's the limit. And I don't want you to worry about, well, how could I actually get that? Or how could that actually happen? Or how could I actually do that? So one thing for me is I've, and this is not a surprise, I have a very deep relationship with Discover Strength. They're an amazing gym and facility that's been franchising now around the country. And I have had in the back of my mind for a year or two, maybe I would do a franchise someday just as an investment for something that I want to do personally, because I so believe in the business. So on one of my personal manifestations, I said, I am invested in a Discover Strength franchise, which is kind of fun. Now, I don't know would I get investors? Would I take a loan from the bank? Would I use some savings? Would I use other money? How exactly I'll do it, I don't care right now. It's really about setting that intention out there. And then the universe, and I I heard this, I don't know if you ever follow or have attended or any done any of the mind Valley work. I've never been to one of their conferences, but you know, they bring in a lot of awesome thought leaders each year. And there was a particular woman, I want to say she's from Australia or New Zealand, but her talk really spoke to me because she had a background as an architect before she went into the spiritual coaching world. And so she analogized it. And this is what I always use when I think about my own life. We literally are the architects of our own lives. And if you picture that on the other side, that our angels that the higher power, that God, that the universe, that whatever you believe in or call it is literally the general contractor, the construction crew, the subcontractors of every kind. And they want you to just hand over the plans. 
If you're going to draw up the, you, you have to draw up your plans. And here's what most people are doing. Not only are they not drawing plans and telling the universe what they want, they're actually drawing plans subconsciously in their head. Like I'm not good enough. I'm fat. I can't do that. That job's not good enough for me. I can't be in that relationship. And they're saying these things to themselves, even though they're not writing them down. And so the universe is bringing them more of that. It really is as simple as it's, it's obviously not, you know, the easiest thing for everyone because we have to overcome our programming and really think big, but just laying the slate clean and thinking if there were no rules, if money was no object, if I had all of the support I needed, what is it that I would create? What would I do? And of course, you know, let's say someone has an intention that they want to make a million dollars for their business next year. Well, if that's in alignment with you being of higher service and having serving more people in nutrition and more, and it's not because you want to buy 24 Porsches, you know what I mean? It's like the universe is going to bring you what's also in your highest good and the good of all. So the intention behind what it is that you want also has to be in alignment. But I hope, does that answer your question? No, it definitely does. And and I'm, I mean, like I said, there, there's so much serendipity to our conversations because even though you don't know what's on my paper um, <laughs> that I do for my outline, I mean, we're, we're heading absolutely heading in, in the right direction. And so, you know, one of the more common limiting beliefs that I hear from women consistently, and frankly, I've heard this from clinicians that are male or female is related to changes in our bodies as we are getting older and not surprisingly weight gain is a huge focus. I think for people that end up coming to see you as well as, as, as well as for me. And so this concept of weight gain is a normal quote unquote function of aging. How do you address that? Like, what is, what is your kind of way that you address that? And the reason why I asked this, when I shared with my listeners that we were connecting they wanted to know what your perspective is, because I think obviously we are examples of women that are, that are thriving at this stage of our lives and doing really well and are grounded and healthy and happy. But this weight gain piece for many women is almost a weight around their necks. Like they can't get away from it. It's like a ball and chain that they cannot get away from. And so obviously that starts with mindset, but what is your like governing philosophy, how do you address this with your clients? Because you're doing energy work, but you're also, you're also addressing some of these body composition changes that women are unhappy about. I'm so glad you asked that, Cynthia, because it is one of the things that frustrates me more than anything about what I do is that there is this belief out there that aging somehow goes along naturally with gaining weight and sort of losing yourself to some degree. I completely disagree with that. And what I ask women to first think about is if that's their belief, I ask them where it came from and why they think that's true. And they may say, well, Kristen, it's happening to me. I mean, here I am at 50, whatever, and I have more weight on. And then I'll say, okay, let's back up. Now I've heard your answer. Now, what is your relationship with strength training? Okay. And we'll go through, do they strength train? Did they ever strength train? When did they stop strength training? Because the truth is I've been doing bod pods and DEXA scans regularly for 15 years. And I have the same weight and the same body fat percentage with minor variations over time than I did back then. That's possible. So I say, we're going to take that, that you would say it's a reason I would say it's an excuse off the table because that's just not anything else. And then I say, okay, now that we've talked about your relationship with strength training, tell me about your relationship with alcohol. Do you feel like you're one of these people that's having wine each night? Are you having wine on the weekends? And then we'll talk about what their relationship looks like with alcohol. I keep saying I'm probably going to eventually be one of these people that just doesn't drink at all because I've my relationship with it has changed so dramatically over the years and I find less and less enjoyment from it. And so I just, I, I feel so much better without it and I'll go weeks and months without it. And then anytime I introduce it back, I'm like, why did I even do that? So it's, it's really about health for me. And then I'll say, okay, now obviously we have to get to your relationship with food. So when are you eating? And I know this is obviously your wheelhouse and I've learned so much from you about that particular topic, but when are you eating? And then let's talk about how are you managing your blood sugar? If I can get them to be following my meal plans for even a week or two, they are amazed at how different they feel. They have more energy. They have less bloat in their belly. They all of a sudden realize that they don't have to crash at two o'clock in the afternoon. They can sleep better. They have more enjoyment in life and they feel in better moods. When we can get the strength training 
alcohol, fasting, and food components. And then of course, I, I don't want to forget about just general movement, which is why I require my clients, if they're willing to, to get Nora Ring, because I really want them tracking steps and seeing what their neat is each day. Those things, once we break all of those down, I'm like, okay, did I miss anything in terms of why for you, you think you're still this outlier who can't lose the weight. Cause I disagree. I know that you can, and I see that you can, I just want to get every single obstacle out of your way so I can help you get there. Well, and it's interesting that you say that my, my college roommate was with me for the weekend. And so we were talking about different things, you know, what she focuses in on what she chooses to eat. And, and she was fascinated. She's, she's very, very much, uh, you know, she's 50, but she looks much younger. And a lot of it's because she stayed very, she lifts a lot and she stayed very lean and really, you know, leans into nutrition. And so we were having a conversation about alcohol in particular. And she said, I don't understand. You just don't drink at all. She was like, you were never a drinker. And I said, but it's one of the few things that impacts my sleep. And my sleep has now become so important to me that I would rather sleep better than have, you know, a martini or a glass of alcohol. And so the whole weekend we kept having these vibrant conversations and she would lean into it. And she said, you really think it makes a difference? And I said, yes. And I said, I'm yes. starting to find when we go to events, more and more people in the health and wellness space don't drink alcohol or they drink very sparingly. And the other thing that you mentioned about the aura or tracking movement, that was, that's what I said to her was I, I always ensure I get anywhere from 12 to 15,000 steps a day. And she was like, how do you do that? I said, well, we walk our dogs in the morning, walk them in the evening. I said, I just try to remain as active as possible. And I really look at that metric, not to be obsessive, but I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, we need to be active. Like our bodies are not designed to be sitting all day long, but yet that has become the norm for so many people. And they're really losing out on opportunities to just honor your body in different ways. Like I know if I'm sitting all day long, if I'm doing a long day of travel, or if I'm sitting at a conference and I'm doing a lot of sitting, I just feel kind of sluggish. Like I don't feel encouraged to get up and move. And yet I force myself to do it because it has become such a large part of my life. I love that you encourage your clients to get their aura ring because it's one of my favorite biohacking things that I own. It is. I love it. I've been wearing one for years and my minimum for steps each day is 15,000. But I do notice because I tend to overdo it rather than underdo it my heart rate variability will take a hit when I'm consistently over 20,000 because it's like, wait, 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 you're not recovering. So then I'll have to have a night of 10 hours of sleep and only 11,000 steps or something like that to really get back on track. But I agree with you. It's one of the most important metrics because it really, when my clients can see the data in what the two martinis at dinner did to their sleep, or when they can see what having the ice cream late at night did to their sleep, it's such a behavior modifier because then you feel like, no, now I'm making a choice from a place of empowerment as opposed to Kristen just told me this or Cynthia just told me this. They told me I can't. And so I can't. It's like, no, I'm now making a choice that I don't want to. In fact, the newest practice that I've started, and I'd be curious if you've ever experimented with this, is every night before bed now, especially because my central nervous system tends to run so sympathetic dominant, I am doing it's the most basic, easy, free Wim Hof, 11 minutes of breath work before bed. And it's bumped my HRV up by 10 points on average for the last week. That's amazing. Yeah. So I just, I'm trying to work on things that really calm my central nervous system down. You know, I do acupuncture almost weekly because it really stills me. I do network spinal analysis, which is um, called NSA. It's like chiropractic care where they don't touch you. And it's a form of Reiki. You mentioned Reiki a little bit ago. So it's similar to Reiki because they're working with the energy outside of your body. But those things are just priorities that I have each week or each month in order to make sure that I'm staying as physically vibrant as possible. Because the other thing, and we haven't mentioned this yet, what people may not understand about energy work is, you know, we have these physical bodies that everyone thinks of as who we are. Well, that's like a fraction of who you really are. You also have a mental body, an emotional body, a spiritual body. We have these things outside that are six feet around us. So when you hear sayings like, oh, the person's energy introduced them before they even walked into the room, that's real. Their energy actually did come into the room before their physical body. When you and I energetically were drawn to each other, when we met in Omaha, our energetic bodies were interacting before our physical bodies ever did. And so I tell people, when you really start delving into this and doing serious energy work, your physical body is the densest part of you. So it will cap how high you can go. So if you are going to ascend on frequency level, in my opinion, and I would say I know in a lot of other healers who would agree with me, you must do things like chiropractic care, 
massage, acupuncture, physical strength training or other activity. Like you have to move your physical body to allow your body to energetic, to keep up with what's happening on your energy level. That's really interesting. And I would have to agree. I, I, you know, I think on a lot of different levels, you know, what I do in the evening has become a priority. And so I've, I actually bought a PEMF mat. You did. And so I did. And so I've been using it after workouts and you, you can change the settings. And then before bed, I was telling my husband, I have some of the best nights of sleep. If I get on that mat for the programming, I can't if it's Delta waves, but programming for brain support heading into bed. And I track my HRV and, and there's specific things that I notice will bump my HRV up. And, and we know that HRV or heart rate variability can, some of it can be dependent on age. If you're looking at age related variances. So I would say, I wouldn't expect my HRV to be like a 20 year old, but I do expect that if I'm working towards supporting the autonomic nervous system, that it will in fact improve. And so that has been I would say life changing. And my husband has now just kind of accepted this is in our bed in our bedroom. <laughs> um, but I always tell him, I said, I get on this and I and I put the heater on and it just it's the greatest sleep induction because I have to fight not to fall asleep. I don't want to fall asleep on it. So I'm like, okay, set the timer, relax, and then I go to bed. And it's really been wonderful. But I should think about doing the Wim Hof breathing. I think that would be super amazing. It's so easy and it's on YouTube and it's got the 11 minute video, which is just the basic one has 55 million views. So wow. people are using it for sure, but I just like, I thought I'll try it for a few nights in a row and I'm really working to get my HRV average over 50 and mm -hmm. it's not there yet. The only time it's been over 50 this year is when I was in Costa Rica in March yes. with no technology, with no computer, sleeping in the woods, no Wi-Fi, and my heart, and of course, no alcohol. And my Wi-Fi was over 50 for the entire week. And I thought this is so interesting. These things that people don't realize they are so much about our lifestyle and mm -hmm. how high wired and high strung and fast moving we can all sometimes be because we're entrepreneurs, we're building businesses, we're and it's just that much more important that we really tune into and pay attention to our central nervous system. It's really interesting. You mentioned Costa Rica. We were there um, for Christmas last year. And the second place that we went to, my kids, of course, thought it was terrible. They loved <laughs> where we stayed, but they had to go to a centralized location because we were so we were so in the jungle, which was amazing. But I had a, a incredible HRV. Like everything was optimized. And my kids, of course, were, they were like, you don't understand. I can't get any Wi-Fi, and I have to go to the hotel lobby and sit there. And I'm like, but this is fantastic. It's Christmas time and we're reconnecting with nature and we're sleeping in. And so of course they thought that was, you know, for a teenager, that's, that's the end of the world in their mind. So kind of getting back to the impact of, of chronic stress and hormones and women and really looking at macros, what are some of the common um, errors that you see women making well-meaning women, because if they, they're following my play or they're following government suggested guidelines, we know what they're leaning towards. What are some of the common misconceptions? Cause you mentioned this blood sugar balancing piece, which I think is so important. What are the things when they come to you that are common errors that you see them making? Yeah, great question. I don't think we can say enough. The fact that I consistently over and over and over see women under eating protein, so you and I know are aligned on that. That is a major thing. And they seem so confused about how they're going to get as much protein in their body as I'm recommending. But I said, just let me guide you through this so that you can start to learn this eating the meal plans that I'm recommending for you. But under eating protein is one. A lot of women that I see don't eat enough. So they don't prioritize themselves because they're prioritizing every single other person on planet earth. They come last. And so then they're binging typically at night on whatever they can get their hands on because they haven't been nourishing their body regularly th throughout the day. And then the other thing is, so under eating protein, under eating in general, and then overeating the wrong things because of this blood sugar imbalance. So I see a lot of, and I, I tell people, I'm really working with you to reprogram you or at a minimum deprogram you from what you thought you was, was healthy because of the way you have been programmed and whether you have ever woken up to it or not, I'm here in part to help wake you up, to understand that you have programming around what you're putting in your body. First thing in the morning, what you're having on your lunch break, what you're making your family for dinner, what you're picking out and taking off the shelf at the grocery store. What there's so much that we receive by way of marketed advertisements that until you have someone actually educate you about how your body really works, and that's what I spend a lot of time doing, um, 
it, it's amazing to me just how people don't realize what they don't know. I had a woman recently who hired me who's a very successful person in her own business, and she was choosing each morning to have a bowl of Raisin Bran because she thought that that was something that was healthy, that it had fiber. And I said, okay, go grab the box of Raisin Bran. Here we are on Zoom. And I said, I want you to read to me the calories. Okay. She read to me the calories. Now I want you to read to me the protein. She read to me the protein. Now I want you to read to me the fat. She read to me the fat. I said, now let's look at the carbohydrates. And she read 48 and she's like, oh my goodness. Cause we had just done this whole lesson. So you know, she's intending, thinking she's doing the right thing because she, in her situation is buying Raisin Bran instead of, you know, Captain Crunch. And because you're marketed that something like that would be healthier, you have this unconscious understanding about things that I really work to just deprogram. So when you can be empowered from a place of choice and intention and say, okay, Kristen said, 30 grams of protein at least at this meal in this breakfast instead of saving it all for dinner and not just grabbing a handful of pistachios on the go, but actually saying, sit down to this meal that has at least 30 grams of protein in it with a lot of vegetables and some healthy fats, mm. and then move on to the next meal. However, many hours later, really having that separate from mealtime and taking the time to eat and really nourish your body, I think is a big one. No, it's huge. And I, I think on so many levels, that is such a common thing to see that women don't even understand that there are three ounces of protein is never going to you know, hit those satiety cues. It's not going to help with muscle protein synthesis. It's not going to help them maintain or build muscle. And when we start reconfiguring macros, typically what I see is the low protein, wrong types of fats, too many carbs and carbs shouldn't be demonized. But if you're insulin resistant, if you have 50 pounds to lose, if you're diabetic, then carbohydrates, you do have to look differently at them. It doesn't mean no carbs. It might mean lower carbs might be ketogenic, really depends on the individual. And when you're talking to your patients about this reprogramming and being intentional, I'm sure that you're probably also talking about nutritional detoxification. I know this is an area of expertise of yours. And so when you're working with them, what is the, the schedule or the frequency that you suggest them? And you're doing a real food detoxification. Let me be clear. It's not a bunch of powders and pills and things like that. It really is working with food. And if you don't already follow Kristen on Instagram, she has the greatest food photos, which is why I'm so <laughs> glad you're doing a cookbook. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, I want that. Talk about this because this is something that I probably haven't spoken about on the podcast enough, but it's certainly really helpful to give people like a little bit of a reset. Yeah. So I love the topic of detox. And I think the word has some like confusing connotations because you're right. Some people think of detox and they would immediately go to juice cleanse or I can't eat for three days. And it's like, that's not what we're talking about here. My detoxification protocol that I personally practice and have been for 20 years and that I recommend to my clients that I take people through in a course is real food, nutritional detoxification. So what does that mean? Well, and you very well know this, I'm sure, Cynthia, but our bodies have two real primary phases of detoxification. They have pathways. So in our phase one detoxification pathways, certain mechanisms of action, certain processes are happening in our body. In our phase two detoxification pathway, which is the more complicated of the detox pathways, other processes are happening. And our body is always working to open up and release toxins through those pathways. But the reality of our modern world is we are constantly inputting ourselves with things that that close, or that I'd say close the door, close the valve sometimes on those pathways, or at least make those pathways not option, not work as optimally. So for example, in the phase two pathways, there is a sulfation pathway which requires having a certain amount of sulfur foods in your diet. So our sulfur foods would be eggs. And I always recommend pasture-raised organic, organic onion, organic garlic, organic daikon radish. Those would be things that help the sulfur conjugation pathway. We also have a glutathione conjugation pathway. And when our body is in detoxification, which it needs to be in a parasympathetic state, by the way, to detoxify. So we have to get out of that fight or flight mode for a while. Our glutathione conjugation process 
our body eats up tons of glutathione, which is of course our master antioxidant. Our body eats up tons of it while we're detoxing. So it's really important that you put in some of the raw materials in your body to make and more glutathione on the spot and keep making it, including some of those amino acids from really high quality protein sources, along with other sort of liver healing foods. So cruciferous vegetables would be a category in my, um, detox course because the cabbages, the Brussels sprouts, the cauliflower and the broccoli, there's also a ton of benefit from citrus. We know we get lots of benefit from dark leafy greens. There's lots of people get to eat protein. I actually reduce the fat. So normally I would recommend a higher, like more than 50% of your calories coming from fat, but on the detox, it tends to be a little lower simply because one of the organs that we're clearing out is your liver and your liver has to process in addition to all of the toxins that come into your body, your liver also processes all of the fat. And a lot of people have livers who have been working on processing industrial seed oils and garbage trans fats and things for years. So their body feels so much better when we can start to get those things out through natural detox. No one likes to hear me say this, which is caffeine does interrupt your phase one detox pathway. So I ask people to go off of caffeine for two weeks when they do this detox. And for most people, that's probably the hardest part. And I tell people headaches are only going to last for a day or two. Even if the most caffeine addictive person can usually get over the headaches by day three or day four, but it really is amazing how much more energy you have once you get that interrupter of your pathways out of the way. I think it's so important and and really emphasizing that you're doing this with real food and it's attainable and achievable. Anyone can do anything for a 14 day span of time. Now, do you do these quarterly or do you do them every other month? How frequently are you doing these programs? I'm doing these quarterly. So the next one will be released in January. So it starts on January 16th of 2023. So that will be January 16th through, I think the last Sunday in January, and then I'll run it again in April and then again in July, and then again in October. So four times a year. And the reality is it's a really good pace. I always say there's people that come to me and they say, I want to lose weight. And I don't know where these 30 pounds came from. And I just need to take them off. And I said, well, look, I'm going to teach you. I always say, I want to teach you how to become lean and fit for life. And if it's someone I'm working with for six months, at some point during that six months, I will put them through this two-week detox. Some people just hire me just to take my detox course, which is great. But I personally use it, and I like my clients to use it as sort of a course correction if we've gotten off track. January is a great time for people to course correct if they've had a little more hedonic deviations during the holidays. And I stole that phrase because I've heard Alan Argon. I don't know if you've interviewed him yet, but I've heard him making the podcast circuit and he used that term and I just love it. So I was in Mexico for a retreat. I had some hedonic deviations. I had some wonderful desserts some nights. And so I came back and because I had been, I was referred to as I had been pushing the pleasure pedal, you know, several more nights than I normally would. Now I'm I'm pushing the, the pleasure break for a little bit. And it doesn't mean detoxification isn't pleasurable, enjoyable food. It just means I'm not escaping anything with chocolate, with, you know, a margarita that I had in Mexico or things like that, that really should be used sparingly and just enjoyed in very random instances, as opposed to all the time. So the detox course is really to get the the protein bars, the to-go foods, those kinds of things off your plate and focus back on real food, lots of vegetables, lots of lean proteins and healthy fats. No, I absolutely love the concept. And when you're talking about strength training, because this is a an important subject specific to what we're talking about, how often, how do we eat around our timing? I know that you are uh, someone that embraces intermittent fasting. And one of the common questions I get is how do I be able to build muscle if I'm also fasting? And so finding that sweet spot, which I know that we'll probably end up addressing I I think I saw on a recent podcast that you said you lift every 72 hours. Now, this is interesting because there are a lot of fit pros, I'm sure that are well-meaning that are out there that are encouraging women to lift five or six days a week. And I'd love to get your reasoning and why that is potentially problematic. Great question. So the science tells us that if you were to do a full body, heavy duty weightlifting session, meaning you hit shoulders, you hit biceps, you hit abs and back, you hit, you know, your glutes, you hit your quads, hamstrings, calves, big parts of your body, some of your upper back. If you do that hard on a Monday, you are your weakest then on Wednesday. You're your weakest 48 hours later. And what do most people do? They go to the gym and lift on Monday and then they say, oh, I'm going to take a rest day in between. And they come back on Monday or on Wednesday. But the reality is you're actually your strongest 72 hours later, which would be Thursday. 
So if I do a heavy duty lift on a Monday, I don't strength train again until Thursday. Now it's not that I'm not moving in those two days in between. I do some cardio classes. I do tons of walking. I enjoy running. So I'm doing other things, but my heavy duty strength training happens every 72 hours. And that's because I, my goal when I'm strength training is not to just go and spend time in the gym. My goal is to build lean muscle tissue. That's what I'm there for. So if I'm going to pay someone, a personal trainer to help me build lean muscle tissue, I want to maximize every single factor that I can control in order to make that happen. So one of the things I'm going to work on getting really um, a good amount of sleep the night before I go into strength train, I'm going to work on making sure that when I am strength training, that after I'm consuming high quality protein relatively quickly after the workout. So it doesn't need to be in immediately 20 minutes right after the workout. There was this belief for a long time, basically on the science, that the anabolic window, which is this period of time after you get done strength training and when you can build muscle, that the anabolic window was like 20 minutes. It was very short. And there's been recent research that's come out. And I I spoke at a resistance exercise conference in May of this year and also in October of last year, where there were other scientists reporting on some of this newer research that said this anabolic window is really more like at least 90 minutes after you get done with a workout. You don't need to get done exercising, still be sweating, have not calmed down your central nervous system and wolf down a bunch of protein. That's just not how our bodies were designed. It doesn't even make intuitive sense if you really think about it. So calming and getting back down in that state and then eating something is great. So, so with the 72 hours or every 72 hours, I tell people on those days is when I'm going to intentionally be a little more liberal with my carbohydrates. And when I say liberal with my carbohydrates, you know, low carbohydrate diet is considered 150 grams or less. So if I would normally have, let's say 50 or 60 on that day, I'm having hundred, 125 grams instead. And I'm getting those from sources like banana, uh, gluten-free oatmeal, some sweet potato, perhaps. Uh, I have some really more lower carb, but they still have more carbs in terms of breads like that you keep in the freezer that I might use on those days, organic apples, lots of berries. It's really whole natural foods um, as much as possible. And so I'm going to be intentional about those days. And then has how I combine it with fasting is, and I've been really interested in a lot of the research that's come out recently on how moving up our fasting window can be so much be- more beneficial. And especially as here we are going into the winter months, and I obviously live in a place in Minnesota where it is dark starting at about 4.30 come November something. It's really depressing. And so I'm aware of the fact now that your body really wants to be eating when it's light out and not eating when it's dark out. So like this morning, I broke my fast at 9.15ish, 9.30 in the morning, but I had already been fasting for almost 15 hours because I stopped eating at 6.15 last night. So I've really been enjoying playing with that. It's allowed me to still get all of the benefits of intermittent fasting, all of the opportunities for muscle protein synthesis four times a day and be building muscle because I strength train in the morning. And then I'm not artificially forcing myself to wait until noon to eat and then keep eating until eight o'clock at night, which also is disruptive to my sleep. So I've really enjoyed this more 10 to six or nine to five type of eating window. And I combine that with making sure I'm eating quality protein and a little bit more carbohydrate on my strength training days. I think that's really helpful and really being aligned with our natural chronobiological rhythms. Like I always say during the summer, I might extend my feeding window, but definitely as we're heading, even in Virginia by four 45, five o'clock, it's really dark. And so I always say like, I make a conscientious effort. And what's interesting is this is very normal for me in this house. But when I have people visiting, like as an example, my college roommate was here all weekend. She was fascinated with the fact that I didn't eat breakfast that I ate, you know, late morning, then I eat, you know, right, you know, five or six o'clock. And so of course, with having a friend in from out of town, you're adjusting your feeding and fasting window to accommodate them, but it had never even occurred to her that there was any changes in insulin sensitivity as the day goes on and and trying to explain to her that if I was going to have a big meal, it would be midday when I'm more insulin sensitive, when, you know, my body is awake and alert because it's daytime. And so I think really understanding that you know, daylight savings and the changes that go on with chronobiology during that time frame, like leaning into those changes as they occur throughout the year is really beneficial. Yeah. And you mentioned something else there, Cynthia, that I think is important, which is I had a client I was on with a couple this morning 
and coaching them over Zoom. And he had asked me about using the Zero Fasting app, which I use. And I also have the BioCoach app, but the Zero Fasting app, just in terms of tracking my hours of eating, I find to be just very easy. So she said, well, how come you do that? So, so why are you actually tracking? And I said, well, I'll give you a perfect example of last night. Last night I got done eating at 6.15. So I just set my start fasting timer. And I actually had an energy session, of course, last night with my, one of my meditation workers. So I had that from 6.30 to 8 on Zoom with a group. And I got done with that. And then I wanted to take the dogs out for a little bit and walk in the dark. And then, of course, was like doing some stuff, cleaning up around the house and sweeping. And it was that little part of me because now it's what I would call witching hour when all of a sudden it's nine o'clock at night. And there was something that was like, oh, gosh, that peanut butter sounds really good. Or that thing in the cupboard sounds really good. And so I know it's not hunger. I'm very aware of the fact that it's either habit or lonely or emotional eating or some other reason. Like, I don't know exactly what it was. But because I had already set my fasting timer, I opened it up and I looked at it and I'm like, wait a second, Kristen, you've been fasting for over three hours already. You're not going to ruin it to have a spoonful of peanut butter, have to put it in your chronometer, start over fasting. That just seems so silly to me. And then what? Wait to eat until noon today instead of being able to eat at 930 this morning. So that's the kind of thing that I use it for is the motivation around because it's different every night. Like you said, when your friend was there or I had gone out to dinner with a friend one night. And so my eating window didn't get done until after eight o'clock, which is late for me. But then I set my fasting timer. And so then I ate a little bit later the next day and just made sure I got my three different meals in before about six or six 30. So I could get back on track. So for me, it's just one of those tools. I always say that the more tools I can have in my toolbox that I can rely on to just take, having to keep all the stuff in my brain all the time. We have plenty of things we have going on in our brain in terms of how we service clients. I want the stuff that I'm doing for me to sort of become on autopilot when I can make it that way. And I think it's important to understand that, you know, there are many of us that like data. We like that accountability. We like to be able to track and monitor. And I think for 75% of my clients, they enjoy it. And then there's 25% it up. It really creates more anxiety and stress. And so whether it's a continuous glucose monitor or a ring, an app on their phone, I always say, you know, take what works for you and leave the rest. And so if you are a listener and you're saying, yeah, I love all those things, but it stresses me out more Then we have to kind of pare things down. Now, I want to be respectful of your time, but one question that came up with significant frequency was what are Kristen's, you know, when you are traveling, what are some of your favorite things to bring with you? Because we all know that 99.9% .9 of what we find in an airport is garbage. What are the things you bring with you in case there's a delay, in case you get hungry? What are some of your go-to foods, or I hate to use the word snack, but food products that you might bring with you. And again, if you watch Kristen on Insta stories, I end up trying out things that I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. I should try that out. What are some of the things you bring with you that are your go-to options? I, I just love that you also said you hate the word snacks because so do I. What does that mean? Like what's a snack? Mm -hmm. It's so funny. I have a list of go-tos. My top favorites are carnivore crisps, which I actually absolutely love. Carnivore snacks are another one. So carnivore crisps and carnivore snacks are very similar, but one carnivore crisps add, adds water and carnivore snacks does not. So they're both just really Redmond's real salt and then grass-fed meat of some kind. So I bring those with me. I also have really enjoyed, and I met the owner of this at Metabolic Health Summit this year or last year, is those Keho bars, K-E-H-O. So they are the first savory bars on the market. They are savory, not sweet. And they're made with a lot of different kinds of nuts, but there is even one that has olives in it or a little bit of sun-dried tomato or things that actually feel like she and I laughed. She said, I think if you eat three of these bars, you could effectively call it a salad. Um, but she, like us, she had a, a corporate job. She worked at Pepsi for years, left to create an entrepreneurial thing, couldn't do the corporate thing anymore. It was really interesting. So that's another one. And then I would say RAR bars, which I know you've tried and love. R-A-W-R, -R, those do need to stay in the fridge. So I typically don't travel with those as much, but I'll bring those if I'm just on the go really quick for a day. And then Perfect Amino Bars by Body Health. I've really started to enjoy those because they add all of the essential amino acids and they really are a better fat source than a protein bar. So that's another one. I tend to always pack little bags of my protein powder with me. So I bring beef protein powder with me. I don't use whey anymore. My body is far too sensitive to whey protein right now. And it's been that way for all of 2022, unfortunately, because I used to really enjoy it. Whey, when you take it on the go, you can shake it in a shaker bottle. Beef, grass-fed beef isolate does not shake well. 
So it tends to be a little more clumpy, which isn't ideal. And then I also am not afraid to bring things like apples and avocados, which are real food. I do bring beef sticks with me. So whether it's chomps or I know you and I both enjoy the um, Paleo Valley because I really like those. So I'll bring those. Some of those epic bars are good too. And then the only other things that I bring, because I do bring my supplements. So I've got a lot of those with me typically, including my creatine. Um, I have that. Uh, the only other things I would say are every once in a while, just in case I want like some little um, treat and another source of healthy fat, I will bring little packets of nut butter. So like that Alavi nut butter, I don't know if you've tried that one. Alavi is L-E-A-V-I and it's based with hemp seed oil and they use only monk fruit to sweeten it, but they've got a blue spirulina and a, um, a blue spirulina and then a, a pink one that's based in pomegranate. And they are delicious. Those are like, a. will bring those with me. And when everyone else is ordering dessert at the table, I'll be sucking on a little nut butter because that'll be my dessert when I'm out. So those are kind of my top. And I also, I should mention to your listeners on my website, energeticallyefficient.com, I have a tab that I've created for Kristen's favorites where I list all of the stuff out in different sections. No, and you do such a good job of finding less well-known products that are out there. And, and I think that's what I really appreciate and value. I mean, you introduced me to Marigold Way, which is generally the one that I recommend, although I don't consume whey, but that's what we have at our house. And they're a wonderful company. And I think as we are entrepreneurs, I really think it's important to support other small businesses. So let my listeners know how to connect with you, how to work with you if they're interested in your detox program, which I actually purchased and now need to, once I'm done with my Chicago trip, I keep saying yes. like every time I have another business trip, I'm like, I need to be home because I have to do so much food prep. Um, let my listeners know how to connect with you on social media, how to, you know, follow what you're doing. Let me know when your new cookbook is coming out. Thank you so much. So my Instagram is MN and that's MN for Minnesota. So it's MN golden girl. And it really has to do with the fact that I have these two gorgeous golden retrievers, one sleeping under my feet right now. So Instagram, I'm probably the most active. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn and that's just under my name, Kristen Rowell. It's care I S T I N. And I have a Facebook that's connected to my Instagram. So that's just under my name as well. And those are the three primary sites that I use. I do have a Twitter, which is linked on my Facebook, but I haven't really been using that much. And just quickly, Cynthia, going back to our conversation about frequency, my observation of the frequency of Twitter is that it's not high. It's not of a high resonance. So I don't want to be on that app having spending time on it where it's going to bring my frequency resonance down. Now, I'm not saying any of these social media apps are fantastic in terms of frequency, but they obviously are platforms that if you follow positive accounts and you create positive content that you'll get more of that, which I think is neat. My website is energetically efficient. And I do have a cookbook coming out. It will be coming out before the end of this year. I'm going to have a link for pre-order and I'll have it on the website, but my cookbook, and I'll release it here because I haven't said this to anyone, is going to be called Eating Efficiently. Love it. Which is really fun because that's really what I teach my clients how to do. And it's what I do each day. So it's going to be fun, easier, simple, uh, less intimidating meals, but also lots of flavor lots of flavor and lots of real food, which is fun. I, I love it. Well, it's been a pleasure. We'll definitely have to have you back. There are so many things we could have talked about. And as I said, I love real, true, organic conversation, especially with people that I know in real life. Hey, if you like this video, you guys are going to love this video and I'll see you there. We are trained in our education to really memorize certain aspects of science that get really applicable in um, treatment of disease, but not so much for prevention. And yet, you know, as we go on, we start to open our eyes to the fact that many of these diseases could be prevented in the first place.